you know, the question is, do you feel like you're on track to win with a more conventional pick? You know, I, I, I've been saying the last couple of weeks, you can't jump halfway across a chasm, right? Biden, you know, Democrats have already jumped into the unknown by replacing Biden with Harris. Yeah. So like, why not roll the dice and go all the way? I don't think that's evil what will happen. Evil style. All right, we are back with Ron Brownstein. He's a senior editor at The Atlantic, senior political an analyst for CNN. Most recent book, Rock Me on the Water, 1974, the year Los Angeles transformed music, movies, television, and politics. Welcome back to the pod, Ron. How's it going, man? Hey, good, good. You know, we just had the 50th anniversary of Chinatown being released. That was like a, that was a big, that was a big moment in the world of Rock Me on the Water. I wrote about it in The Atlantic. And who would have thought that 50 years later, America would turn its lonely eyes to essentially Noah Cross, which was the bad guy played by John Huston, and who had many things in common with Donald Trump as, uh, as, the, as, their, as their savior. So uh, I highly recommend- Am I in trouble that I've never seen Chinatown? Yeah, you are actually. I'm yes. in trouble. Yeah, that, that's can you can you write me? Could you do me a memo of of, <clears throat> of uh, cultural touchstones from 1974 that I need to? Yeah, have you seen need to Have take you in? seen both Godfathers? I thought I better no. I better not answer that. No, don't answer that. Yeah, that that's really unforgivable. You know, <laughs> the other day, the other day, I was watching my friend Ben Mankiewicz, uh, who's great. You know, introducing Casablanca uh, about six months ago, actually, on uh, on Turner Classic Movies, and he said. He described it as the greatest movie of Hollywood's golden age, which I immediately picked up on. My, my ears perked up because yeah. he was leaving open the possibility that there was a greater movie in Hollywood's silver age, which is what 67 to 76 is known as. And in fact, hmm. he was leaving open room for The Godfather. Okay. We'll, we'll get we'll get Sonny Bunch over on the Culture Podcast. You, you got to do all that. that. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Let's all right. So let's talk about this. The, the article yeah. is uh, Can Kamala Harris reassemble the Obama coalition? So let's get yeah. nerdy. And I guess my first question is, I, I, you know, you don't write the headlines. So so maybe you just right. you, maybe you don't agree with that premise. Uh, yeah. Is she trying to reassemble the Obama coalition? I guess it's the first. Well, I, I think she's going to have to do. Well, look, I, you know, it's the updated version of it. So Obama, you know, we think of Obama as mobilizing young people and people of color at, at very high levels. Uh, and also running well among uh, college educated white voters, you know, suburban um, uh, cultural liberals. <clears throat> Obama also uh, ran uh, very well competitively, he didn't win them, but he ran competitively among working class white voters in those Rust Belt states that he won, which at that point included Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Ohio and Iowa. Right. It's not really plausible uh, <laughs> for any Democrat to run as well in the Trump era among those working class white voters anymore right. as um, Obama did in 2012 and two th especially <clears throat> in 2008. Um, but if you look at what happened in 2020, Tim, right, Joe Biden did not come close to matching Obama's numbers with those working class white voters uh, and older white voters. But he ran a little better than Hillary Clinton did among them in the first Trump race. I mean, he he improved slightly among them. Uh, and that really was important. It wasn't the only reason, but it was important in him taking back Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, which were the three states that made Trump president in 2016 by a combined 78,000 votes. So fast forward to where we are today. I mean, if you compare, why was Biden in a weaker position than he was in 2020? Why was Trump winning when he was losing by eight points at this point in the 538 poll average? in 2020. Well, the biggest reason by far was that Biden was eroding with younger and non-white voters, right? Um, uh, you know, Biden was running, has been running significantly weaker than he did among black voters, really weaker than he did among Hispanic voters, and really weaker than he did among uh, young voters. Harris has the potential, I mean, her, her, her best electoral asset is the potential to reverse Biden's biggest weaknesses and to regain some of the ground he has lost, maybe a lot of the ground he has lost since 2020 among young voters and black voters, <clears throat> and less certainly, but certainly within the realm of possibility, some recovery among Hispanic voters. But, but, you know, even amid all of his other troubles, Biden this year was holding relatively more of his, of his support among those blue collar and older whites, right? So mm -hmm. he improved over Hillary among blue collar and older whites. 
And he was largely holding that in 2024, despite everything else going on. So while Harris, I think, is very well positioned to do better among black voters, among young voters, maybe Hispanic voters, <clears throat> and even to squeeze a few more points out of pro-choice college educated voters, the big demographic question, which has big geograph geographic implications, which we'll talk about in a minute, is whether she can match what Biden did among working class and older whites in 2020, or whether she starts sliding back further toward the Hillary level of 2016, in which case, you know, she's going to need really big numbers among the other groups where she's stronger to offset that. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, yeah, no, it totally makes sense. A lot to chew on there. So let, let's focus on the positives for uh, the vice president first. Um, here's there's We have a tiny bit of data and it's so early, but it's just worth pointing this out because it speaks to the point of your article so so closely. Uh, Civics, uh, which is a pretty credible uh, organization, uh, they started tracking Trump versus Harris two weeks ago. Um, and through 721, so that's through Sunday. So this was before uh, actually the handoff, right? So, so we don't know if there's been mm -hmm. any effect at the handoff. But uh, Biden trailed Trump 46-44 nationally. Harris was ahead 48-46. This is better than wow. she's been in some other polls, but let's just use it as a baseline. Um, they they noted, noted this on why. Young voters 18 to 34, Biden plus 8, Harris plus 20. Independents, Trump plus 16 to Trump plus 8. Um, Harris then also picks up seven points among black voters and eight points among Hispanic voters, almost all yeah. from the third party undecided camp. So like that, I mean, that is a essential outline right. of like what is and, a good and scenario for her. Absolutely. There's a, there's a Quinnipiac poll as well, which actually had Trump ahead, but showed some of the same changes. I mean, you know, certainly Harris should be in position to reverse what polls have found of the gains for Trump among black voters. And look, there are lots of Democrats who don't believe those anyway, right? Um, now, can she get all yeah, the I don't way believe back the Democrats to that don't believe them, but okay. But yeah, right, sure. right, there you go. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not sure. I, I think e whether even Harris can get back all the way back to Biden's level among black voters in 2020, I think is probably not going to happen. Uh, you know, it's hard to imagine there isn't going to be some erosion among black men relative to 2020, mm -hmm. because nominating Harris does not eliminate the effects that inflation has had on their view of, you know, whether their life was more affordable under this presidency or under Trump. Um, I, I don't think she gets all the way back there, but I certainly she should be able to reverse some of those gains among black voters. Uh, Hispanic voters, you know, it's a little less clear. Now, you know, with Hispanic voters, what's important is that uh, the erosion since 2020 for Biden has been a both been among both men and women to a greater extent than black voters. Black voters, mm -hmm. the losses are mostly concentrated among men. Hispanic voters, I was just talking to someone on Sunday, the, the decline is pretty equal. So can she improve among Latinas? I would think there's a strong chance of that. How much of that erosion can she claw back among Latino men? Uh, we're going to find out. Now, uh, Having said that, there there is, you know, and then young people, younger whites, especially younger white women, you yeah. know, I kind of put them under the subhead of the third group, which is that um, Biden was somewhat underperforming among people who support abortion rights. I mean, people who support abortion rights were not immune to the question of whether Biden is too old to be president. Or and there was also the, the famous of whether, TikTok of the college girl who's like, Roe was overturned when he was president. What, shouldn't he yeah. have done something? You know, so like there's all yeah, of that element exactly. of it too. So, I mean, I think there is there is more room for Harris, uh, like in the Quinnipiac poll that came out yesterday, they sent me some additional data that they didn't publish. She was already at 62 percent among college educated white women, which is pretty good, but probably not her ceiling. You know, there's there's room to grow there to maybe 65 or 66. Um, uh, Why but, not 68? You know, it, Let's just go. Let's okay. just the, well, the there are back. there are some there are some college educated white women who are pro life or evangelical yeah. or yeah. you know really worried about the border. Um, uh, uh, by the way, well, that's a separate issue. We shouldn't bring that up here. But Mike Madrid has an interesting view about college educated women versus Hispanic women and what the way Republicans are trying to reel back the college educated white women who are pro choice is by making them really afraid of 
immigrants and the border. And yeah. by doing that, they risk the inroads they've made among Latinos, especially hmm. women. Um, but so, so if you look at it this way, you say, okay, Harris should be able to do better, definitely do better among black voters, probably do a little better among pro-choice white women. Uh, and, and, and I regain at least some ground among Latinas, maybe Latino men as well. But, you know, when you look at the other side of the ledger, you know, Joe Biden was running pretty close to even among whites over, you know, older whites, whites over 65. Can she do that? And even more importantly, um, you know, Joe Biden didn't massively improve among whites without a college degree relative to Hinton, Clinton, but he did a little better, about five points better nationally and, and, and some, a little more than five points better, according to the exit polls in Michigan and Pennsylvania, which we'll get to, and Wisconsin, I think Michigan and Wisconsin, not Pennsylvania, which we'll get to in a minute. So, okay, you know, in those states, those are a really big block of voters. Half of voters or more are, are whites without a college degree in those three critical states across the Rust Belt. So if she cannot maintain Biden's level with them, if she starts sliding back toward these really low levels that Hillary had with them, uh, the blue collar whites in 2016, you, you need significant turnout and gains among you know, the white collar whites, young people and minorities who are mostly black voters in those states. And that, yeah. I think, is going to be that's that's the ledger on her. I, it's clear where her opportunity is. It's also pretty clear where her risk is. Yeah. The one opportunity that I think, in addition, when you talk about those groups on the risk side of the ledger, mm -hmm. is it is it possible like, like we haven't been able to run an experiment? You know, I, is it possible that the older whites that were sticking with Biden like really, that was more of this, that was more of like a anti-Trump thing. Like these are people that did not like the Clintons. They were probably Fox News viewers, right? And then Trump gets in there, and it's like, oh my God, this guy's this guy's horrible. Like we did see that in Republican voters against Trump. So maybe some of those folks are really more anti-Trump voters than pro-Biden voters. And then in the in the non-college whites, similar to how you mentioned with the Latinas, isn't there not potential for growth with the non-college white women? You know, uh, particularly around right. the issue of abortion. Sure. Um, it, by the way, in that in that Quinnipiac poll, which is the, you know, the first measure we have, uh, she was they sent me this. She was running at 38 percent with non-college white women, which may sound terrible, but which is about what Democrats get these days. Um, I don't mm -hmm. remember exactly what Biden's number was with them in 2020, maybe a little better than that. But, yeah, I mean, you know, um, uh how men react to this, you know, we're going to see it is eight years later than than Clinton. Um, but there is the risk, again, especially and with Clinton older, had some other vulnerabilities besides being a woman. I just like yeah. she'd been the, she had been targeted for 20 years as like as corrupt and, as an insider. And, right. and like, right. You know. Yeah. But 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 but, you know, the thing that I think the thing that he, I, one way to one way I think about this is that Harris has to carry all the crosses that Biden did in terms of discontent on their record, uh, That's true. you know, inflation and immigration. The same people who are upset about their record on those issues, Biden's record are not going to be, you know, automatically going to Harris. The big difference is that while she might be on the defense on the same questions, minus the one big one of age, she can go on the offense much, much more effectively. I mean, Biden yeah. really did not have the, Biden wasn't a great communicator when he was 50. And, you know, I covered his presidential campaign when he was like 50. Um, and, you know, he wasn't a great communicator then. And he really did not have the capacity to drive the offensive Democratic message against Trump centered on the idea that he's a threat to rights, values and democracy, but also that he's going to favor the rich over the middle class. Um, you saw yesterday, you know, in her first campaign, yes. she can deliver that message much yeah. more effectively. She can make the anti-Trump case yeah, on the day to day job of being a candidate at this point, she is just much more effective than Biden, right? Despite you know, beyond all of the yeah. demographic and you're an old pro, we're talking about. that does matter, right? Like, we yes, campaigning it, it matters. Matter. We're all doing this for a reason. This is not all just yeah. for show, like, that does no, it has does to matter. matter somewhat. Yeah, it's not everything. <laughs> I mean, you know, especially in the presidential race, conditions matter more than in any other race, I think, you know, that. People are voting on kind of their, their broad sense of the country and their broad sense of the candidates. But yes, I mean, she can draw very stark contrasts with Trump. I'm a prosecutor. He's a convicted criminal. 
you know, I put rapists in jail. He's been adjudicated to be a sexual abuser. I went after fraud, financial fraud. He's, you know, been, been um, can, what, what is the word, judged on, you know, judged to have con- committed financial fraud. Yeah, fraud uh, yeah. And of course, she's now 20 years younger, now the doddering old guy. Yeah. So there are like some really powerful contrasts. But when you when you get down to it, ultimately, uh, you know, the, the question will be whether the voters she brings are more numerous than the voters she might lose. And the other half of what we really should talk about is, well, what are the geographic implications? Yeah, I want to go. I want to go state by state. But really quick before we go state by state, is there do you have any thoughts on just the turnout, the just the closing of the enthusiasm gap, which I think is the other potential? It it should help. Yeah, it should help. Absolutely. I mean, also the overall turnout, you know. Um, uh, you know, Tom Bonier at Target Smart, who is, you know, one of the, the smartest people in the Democratic Party on voter targeting, you know, told me for a story a few weeks ago, he thinks turnout could be as low as 140 million, down from 160 million if it was Biden yeah. and Trump. Uh, more people are going to vote now, without a doubt, yeah. both after the assassination attempt, which is certain to gin up a lot of Republican turnout. And I sure. think there's no question that Harris will generate more Democratic leaning turnout than uh, than Biden would. Mike Pothorzer, who used to be the political director of the AFL CIO, Mike has calculated that over the last three elections, 2018, 2020, and 2022, there are more than 90 million separate human beings, 90 million separate individuals who have come out in one or more of those elections to vote against Trump and Trumpism. That is significantly more than the people who have come out to vote for Trump and Trumpism. Like over 90 million right. people. You don't need 90 million people. I know. Steve lost win. some of those people probably, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a big, it, 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 And so if it's she, efficient. you know, there is, there is a, an audience out there that she will have a better chance of turning out than Biden. But again, the question of where she might give some ground is really important uh, because it has huge implications for the geography of the map which is how we pick the president yeah. overall. All right, let's go state by state. Um, the, 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 to me, so Sam Stein in the last segment still was pretty pessimistic about Arizona. To me, I, I think Arizona is a big change potentially here. I think that she uh, you know, could bring that back onto the map. Um, I think we saw a lot from 2022. There's a big group of my people, the disaffected former Republicans mm-hmm. in Maricopa, you know, who I think would be open to Harris, especially if she picked a Mark Kelly or somebody like that, um, of that in that vein. Um, so what do you think about that? Does it, does Arizona become more in play or is that not where you would uh, start as, as the state that make, has the biggest difference? Well, uh, yes, it does become more in play, I think without question. Yeah. And exactly for the reason you said, which is her potential to regain ground among white suburbanites around Phoenix who just were wavering on whether they could vote for Biden, both because of inflation and his age, yeah. Um, but like Arizona, like it, 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 not to not to kind of uh, you know re ask your question. No, I mean, re ask really, the question. The, really, the issue, the issue with Harris, if you think about where Harris is strong, right? Younger, more diverse, potentially white collar suburban women a little more than Biden. Those th- those strengths should allow her to be more competitive than Biden in all of the Sunbelt swing states, Georgia and North Carolina with their big black populations in the Southeast, Arizona and potentially Nevada in the Southwest, where she should be able to improve at least somewhat among Hispanics. Now, Biden's deficit in all of those states was pretty formidable, you know, when he got out of the race. I mean, he he was not on the brink in any of them. So, so Jackie me, Rosen and Ruben Gallego were winning in the Senate races in Nevada. And Arizona. They were winning. That's why those jumped they out were winning. to me over the other two. Right. Uh, they were winning. Well, we could talk about that as well. But, um, you know, let's not forget in 2016 and 2020 presidential years, exactly one Senate candidate out of 69 races won in a state that voted the other way for president. So whether right. they can hold it is another question. But, okay. but, North Carolina, certainly not, I don't think anybody really sees North Carolina as, you know, as an option, but Georgia, Arizona, and Nevada, with Arizona and Nevada and Georgia probably in that order, um, can she bring those back into play with her strengths? She is stronger among the groups that are 
numerous in those states. They're younger and they're more diverse. And Biden was was losing ground with them. And that was what had tipped them to Trump. But the hole she's trying to climb out of in those three states is pretty substantial. So, you know, whether she can put Georgia with its 16 electoral college votes back in play or Arizona and Nevada with its combined 17 is really critical because if she can't, if she can't, she is in the same situation as Biden, which is that to win, she would have to um, sweep Michigan, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, plus the one congressional district in Omaha. And if you're looking at those three states, they are not built as much for her demographic strengths. They are built largely around her demographic challenges. So, you know, if you're, if you're talking about Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, which were all part of what I once called and has lasted the blue wall, 2009 coined the blue wall. Uh, that'll be like on my tombstone, you know, that father of the blue oh, wall. Um, uh, you know, Trump. Pretty good tombstone. T- my my, my tombstone. attempt to coin red dog Democrats. I don't think I don't think that's had the same staying maybe, power. But maybe, you know, yeah. you never know. You know, they they even have a red wall. In I, I met I was speaking at something the other day. I met some guy who was like an MP, and he was like, "Wait, you coined the blue wall? You're the one who gave us the red wall." I'm not really sure I understand the concept of the red wall, but they it, it's apparently big over there. Anyway, look, Trump was president. Why was Trump president? Because he won Michigan and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. He dislodged them from the blue wall by a combined 78,000 votes. By the way, just just to, just so people understand, the blue wall was not just those three states. The blue wall was the fact that after Obama's second victory in 2012, Democrats had won 18 states plus the District of Columbia for six conse- at least six consecutive elections. So most states that either party had won over that many elections uh, since the formation of the modern party system. And then in 2016, Trump dislodged three states from the 18, from the blue wall, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. You know, since 2016, all of them has trended back toward the Democrats. I mean, Democrats won yeah. the governorships in all of them in 2018. Biden won them all fairly comfortably by local standards in 2020. Uh, and then uh, in 2022, Democrats won the governorships again, in each case by a bigger share of the vote than Biden did. So like they have every reason to be optimistic going into this election uh, about their standing in those states. Problem is Biden was trailing in them too, much more narrowly than in the Sun Belt, but trailing as well. So yeah. if Harris can't win Georgia or both Arizona and Nevada, she's got to sweep them like Biden had to sweep them. Okay, can she do that? Well, those are states that are can't she win win Arizona, Michigan and Pennsylvania? No. Uh, Yes. Arizona, Michigan and Pennsylvania. If she were Arizona can replace Wisconsin. Yes. But Wisconsin is the easiest of the three at this moment for Democrats. Yeah. So this is where I want to go, though, really quick to you. Just uh, you know, the demographic numbers better than me. But um, in a weird way, like so Wisconsin has been the one where Biden had been polling the strongest of the three. Yes. But Definitely. demographically, isn't it not right that Pennsylvania and Michigan, you know, w- still have more of those groups that we think that Kamala could perform better in? And so I guess that do you get stuck between a rock and a hard place where she's in the in the one swing state where Biden was the strongest is, I guess, maybe her weakest at, by comparison to him? Or is that not right? Uh, that's a really good way of putting it. Um, I, you know, look, I, there is clearly a pro-choice majority in, in Wisconsin as demonstrated by that state Supreme Court election in 2023. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, Wisconsin, 90 percent of the voters are white and right. somewhere between 55 and 60 percent of the voters are non-college whites. Um, so on paper, it's a tough state for her. Um, uh, and yes, she can replace that with Arizona. Um, if she loses Michigan, she can replace it with both Arizona and Nevada. Right. Uh, if she loses Pennsylvania, you're talking Arizona and Georgia or Georgia and Nevada. So you kind of get a sense of the escalating difficulty of replacing any of the old blue wall states. Pennsylvania and Michigan are pretty similar demographically. About 80 percent of the voters are white in both of them compared to 90 uh, percent in Wisconsin. There's a bigger black population. There's a meaningful Hispanic population in Pennsylvania. There's obviously the Arab American population uh, in Michigan. Um, though these are states where I think Michigan and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, where Harris is going to have to squeeze out a little more from the white collar whites. She's going to have to get more black turnout and bigger black margins than Biden was likely to get. 
Uh, and that would potentially allow her to squeeze by, even if she gives back a couple of points from what Biden got in 2020 among the working class whites. I mean, that is that is still, you know, I think Arizona, I think there, I think she definitely can compete for Arizona. And I think Arizona is the best of the three, uh, you know, uh, Sunbelt swing states that Biden won. Uh, in 2020 for her out of Arizona, Nevada, and Georgia. I think Arizona is definitely the best. Um, but, you know, Arizona can only replace Wisconsin. Arizona right. can't replace Michigan. Arizona can't replace Pennsylvania. So, like, if it was up to me, you know, she'd be picking Gretchen Whitmer or Josh Shapiro as her running mate. Uh, Mark Kelly is is probably better suited for the job, better able to walk into a debate at this point. But Democrats can win Arizona and lose. You know, uh, I think if you're making a hierarchy, Pennsylvania is the state that they are least likely to win without. And that would elevate Shapiro unless you want to make really roll the dice and do what I I, what I find a lot of enthusiasm for, even among male Democratic consultants, is really making history, picking Whitmer, doubling down on change, doubling down on choice um, and trying to just kind of overwhelm Trump with your strengths. Right. Rather than trying to shore up yeah. your weaknesses, okay. which is what the so other. So this was now your two in a row. Sam was just saying this, too. I, and may, so maybe maybe this is my, you know, went to all boys high school and is gay internal misogyny that I try to fight through. You know, now that I'm a girl, dad, but big, I just worry no, about it. Not, I, worry, I just look at that and I'm like, man, if the problem is with these, you just laid out the problem demos. Black yes. men, Hispanic men, working white working class men and white working does, class doesn't women. Doesn't that feel a little risky? To- Yes, it's yeah. yes. Doesn't that feel more than a little risky? risky. It it is totally risky. But you know, the question is, do you feel like you're on track to win with a more conventional pick? You know, I, I I've been saying the last couple of weeks, you can't jump halfway across a chasm, right? Biden, you know, Democrats have already jumped into the unknown by replacing Biden with Harris. Yeah. So, like, why not roll the dice and go all the way? I don't think that's evil can evil style. Think, yeah. Evil can evil. Um, uh, I was seeing Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young on their maybe their last American show ever on the night he tried to jump across the Snake River. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I, I don't think she would do that. But I, I am surprised by how many kind of conventional white male Democratic strategists think that, that think that would be the move. Like I said, if you pick if you're picking Whitmer, you're trying to overwhelm Trump with turnout from your strengths. If you're picking one of the white guys, you're trying to shore up one of your weaknesses in the places where he is strongest. Actually, I could write that. That's a pretty good column. Um, <laughs> that is a good column. Uh, We've helped you brainstorm yeah. your next one. Yes, exactly. But th- that's the difference. Like Shapiro or Kelly are the only ones that I think make sense among the white guys. Uh, but there is a case for Whitmer. I don't think she'd, I, I, you know, I would be surprised. She's, she's keeping basically the same Biden team. This isn't, you know, campaign team. I'm not sure this is a move they would make. So I would think you would get Kelly or Shapiro. And Shapiro makes more sense because he's more, you know, he's he's in a state that's more important to your fortunes than Kelly. Sorry to your native Arizona. No, that's all right. No, it's all good. Uh, we're going to carry on. Um, you're, you're at Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. And we'll see, uh, we'll see who, who she carries us on with. Ron Brownstein, thank you so much, oh, my man. Yeah, Appreciate you coming good. back. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't, do, I, I couldn't do Chinatown took, um, or the Godfather references. Did, I can do music did. references, though. Uh, we'll catch That's, you next time through. All right, brother? Thanks for having me. All right. Take care. All right. We'll see you. And we'll be back tomorrow for Wednesday edition of the Board Podcast. See you then. Peace. <laughs>